This program is made possible by the partners and friends of Bob Yandian Ministries. Coming up on this episode of Student of the Word. In the midst of time periods where you're so filled with anxiety, when you're so filled with the problems of this world, the Holy Spirit will again bring to you the remembrance of God's love because it was from his love that he died for us. For God so loved the world, that included me, that included you, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, that's Bob, that's you, believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. So glad you're here. I'm going to be teaching on the subject of the all-sufficient God. I'm going to be taking up maybe one, maybe two aspects of God and his greatness. So I'm offering a series called Knowing God that really brings up all the attributes of God. I'm sure I must have missed something somewhere, but it's got a lot on there. It talks about his all, uh, his power, omnipotence, his all-knowing omniscience. It talks about his character, it talks about uh, the fact that he knows the future. That's his uh, the fact that he knows everything is very important. And on top of that, it deals with his sovereignty, which is so uh, misconstrued today and people just don't understand it. So it brings it out just scripturally, makes everything easy to understand. Again, the very nature of God. So the announcer will come on at halftime, tell you how you can have a copy of that for yourself. So turn with me to Zephaniah chapter three. And um, I like going to these Old Testament uh, obscure scriptures because it makes people stop and think, where in the world is Zephaniah? Well, go look it up in your uh, concordance or find it in the opening of your Bible and um, or else just you know, hit it on your iPad and find it. And Zephaniah chapter three. And then when you get to heaven and Zephaniah meets you, he'll say, did you ever read my book? You'll say, well, Bob taught on it one time, a section of it. So Zephaniah chapter three, we're gonna read verses 17 through 20. And here it says, the Lord your God is in your midst. The mighty one will say, he will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. I will gather those who sorrow over the appointed assembly who are among you, to whom its reproach is a burden. Behold, at that time I will deal with all who afflict you. I will save the lame and gather those who are driven out. I will appoint them for praise and fame in every land where they put the shame. At that time, I will bring you back, even at the time I gather you, for I will give you fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I return your captives before your eyes, says the Lord. Although this is addressed to Israel, first of their future deliverance, we know that in here because again, it was written back there at the time. In fact, let me give you some of the background for the prophets. Most prophets dealt with issues going on in their day. And uh, we know that from the uh, book of Joel. Joel happened at a time when four major plagues had come through the land and he takes each one of those four plagues and then uses them as an analogy of four more times when Israel's gonna be coming in, the final one will destroy them, and that's in 70 AD. And so he refers to that, then adds a later one to it. He talks about the coming tribulation and the battle of Armageddon. He used something that happened in their time period that they understood, and really we look at, we don't quite understand what he's talking about. Go back and find out what was front page news at that time because the the, the, the uh, writers of the word of God use that, and God would use that to where the people go, oh, I see that. And that's what we do today. Ministers, don't be afraid to take what's going on today. And really, you don't have to take sides on particular issues. Uh, you can, I think, when it comes to political things, you must take sides on it based on what the Word of God has to say. But if it's just general things happening in your area, what you can do is bring a story out that everybody knows about and use it as a type. Jesus did this. He made reference one time to a tower that fell over on some people and said, do you think God did that? Or you think that happened because these people were in some kind of sin? Then he brought out, no, there's just certain things that happen because there's a curse on this earth. And he used something for their time period, but even brought it out. And of course, we probably don't even have record of it today. It's just something that happened in Jesus' day, and we don't even know about it today. But because Jesus said it, it was brought out. Here in this verse of scripture, he's talking about something that happened to them, but points to a future time of deliverance for them. Again, although this address is addressed to Israel and refers to their future deliverance from an event in their time period, it still applies to believers of all ages, but includes us today in the church age. It includes where you live. It includes your home. 
home. It includes your family. And it's simply saying the Lord will deliver you and is in your midst. It means he doesn't have to be searched for. We don't have to go look for him. He said he will never leave us nor forsake us. And even one of his titles in the Old Testament was the fact Jehovah Shammah, he is the Lord that's present. Jesus made reference to this one particular ministry of the Holy Spirit when he said the Holy Spirit who is with you shall be in you. He made reference to an Old Testament ministry that still just breach, comes right over into the New Testament, transfers right over to the New Testament, the fact he will never leave us nor forsake us. He is the Lord Shama, the Lord who is present with us. And then Jesus said there's more ministries of the Holy Spirit yet to come. He's simply saying this passage of scripture, an Old Testament promise, the Lord who will deliver you is in your midst. He doesn't need to be searched for because he told us in the New Testament he would never leave us nor forsake us. If there is no deliverance from God, understand this, there is no deliverance at all. We look to natural things around us. We look to our president. We look to congressmen. We vote for the right people and we should, but I don't look to them for deliverance. Deliverance comes from God. I look for momentary appeasement. I look for momentary uh, stopping of forces of evil around Around us, but I still know it's only momentary. I've read the end of the book. It's going to look like Satan's going to win for a while, but then Jesus is going to come back and destroy him completely. So again, if there is no deliverance from God, I repeat it, there is no deliverance at all. With him, all things are possible, but without him, we can do nothing. But we do have him with him. We're born again. He's with us. We're with him. We are like friends that walk with each other. The Bible says in the Old Testament that God walked with them. And in one case, in the case of Enoch, Enoch just suddenly disappeared. He said he walked with God and was not because God took him. Great example of us. If we live in the rapture generation, I can tell you this, we're going to be walking with God one day and suddenly we just won't be here. In fact, it's kind of like God was down here walking with Enoch and said, I enjoy walking with you, Enoch, here on this earth, but how about you go with me to my house and I'm going to show you where I live and took him up there. And of course, Enoch didn't want to come back. It's sad we often have to learn things for ourselves. And we usually don't listen to others who have gone through things. They're trying to warn us. Zephaniah went through a tough time. And he's simply telling us that. But he's simply saying, what I did, you can do. Because there's promises in the word of God that never change. If God promised in the New Testament, he'd never leave us nor forsake us. It's because he promised in the Old Testament, he would never leave us nor forsake us. And promises us today in the 21st century that he will never leave us nor forsake us. God doesn't want us to have the attitude, I'll learn it all by myself. How many people do that? They want to re they want to reinvent the wheel. I've had ministers tell me, well, I'm not going to study those books that you talk about, ones written back in the 20s, 30s, 60s, whatever. I'm not even listening to a lot of ministers. I tend to get mine directly from the Word of God. I can tell you this, the Old Testament writers wrote and the New Testament writers took it from them. They said, as it is written, as it is written. Jesus even said, as it is written. Paul said, as it is, as it is written. Revelation is built upon revelation. And listen, there's times you'll read things in the Old Testament that will blow your mind. The revelation that God gave to Zephaniah, to Zechariah, to Malachi, to the minor, the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, he gave to them. And we're still not completely understanding it today. We still find new depths of it. And then you come along and think, well, I'm not going to read all that. I'll just find it out for myself. And literally God has told us to even follow after people in Hebrews chapter 12, be followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Not only can you look at Bible men, uh, people. You not only can look at prophets of the word of God, you can look at ministers today. You can look at pastors. You can look at evangelists that live for God and look at that and in areas learn from them and apply it to your life. You can still be yourself. These ministers that say, well, I don't want to study other ministers. I don't want to follow after them. You're forgetting one of the greatest things, and that is the fact that you can still be yourself. You can take what they have learned, apply it into your life, make it your own, and preach it and minister it, and it'll come out as you, not as brother so and so. All I'm saying is God has left all these things that we keep going after, and here Zephaniah is telling us this is the God that lives in the midst of us, the God that delivered in Zephaniah's time, the God that delivered the children of Israel through the Red Sea, the God that rained down fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah, the God that brought them through and brought down the walls of Jericho is the same God that worked in Zephaniah's time. But the great news is he's still the same God today. He never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Ministers today, understand again, you're following the same God that led Moses, that led Joshua, that led all these people back there, and he's leading you today. Our deliverance is in us, we who are born again. Not only is he with us, he, Jesus promised he would be in us. 
something Zephaniah didn't have. In Zephaniah's day, in Abraham's day, in David's day, in Moses' day, the power of God was somewhere else. It was either in a tabernacle, that's a tent made out of, out of uh, badger skins and, and other skins, and then also later in a temple made out of stone. That's where the Holy Spirit's presence lived. But when Jesus Christ arose from the dead, the power of the Holy Spirit was left, took out of that temple and moved inside of us on the day of Pentecost and has been here ever since. So the Lord is not only with us in our presence, he now lives inside of us. Our deliverance that's in us is because he's been we've been born again. He's inside dwelling in each one of us. Our body becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit and he lives inside of us. We are called the church today. A building can be called a church while we are in it, but we're always the church because he's always inside of us. God doesn't come to live in me on Sunday morning and then maybe once during the middle of the week. No, he lives in me all the time. So the building I go to can be called the church because I occasionally uh, go there. I go there for a service or two, but while I'm there, it's called the church. In the meantime, it's just an empty building. The reason why the Holy Spirit moved out of that place, the most expensive place in the world, practically the one of the eight wonders of the ancient world, the temple that was in Jerusalem. And Jesus even said later as he walked out of that temple, that one stone will be left on another. It's going to come tumbling down. The reason why is because the Holy Spirit no longer lives there. He no longer needs that place. He lives inside of us. So, Again, our deliverance is in us because why we are born again. He's inside dwelling in you and dwelling in me, as well as the church, the collection of believers. This is what Zephaniah was saying. You don't have to go search the distances of the world. You don't have to chase after prophets. You don't have to go from meeting to meeting. The God that you need deliverance from is right there in your midst, but also inside of you. And that's what he's telling us. I want you to understand this, especially you ministers that are watching today. I'm telling you to tell your congregation that they can get deliverance outside the church service. What you're teaching can be taken home. I mean, they don't have to come necessarily to the church to have hands laid on. Have their family lay hands on them. Have them call the phone and have another person agree with them. Because we're told if two shall agree on earth is touching anything, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Get that across to them so they can understand this. The very God of Zephaniah who's in the midst of them in that day is in the midst of their family. And on top of that, when they're alone at their office, Office. They may be in an office by themselves. The door is closed. The Holy Spirit's presence is still with them. And anything they need deliverance from is simply one simple prayer, one statement of faith away. Father, I completely trust in you to bring me through this situation. I can't do it. Without you, I can do nothing. But with you, all things are possible. That's the God we serve. I want to speak to you very quickly too before the break. And that is if you're not a partner with me, would you become a partner with me? Maybe the Holy Spirit's speaking to you, maybe not. But you know what? You can purpose in your heart to be a partner with me. You don't have to have the Holy Spirit tell you everything. You're mature enough. And by actually not telling you anything, the Holy Spirit's saying, I trust you. And so if you do, then why don't you become a partner with me? Go to my website, bobyandian.com. There you'll find out how you can become a partner with me. And I thank you ahead of time because I still have great things I want to do. And you're a part of it. And you and me together, the Bible says, if one, that's me, can put a thousand to flight. Two, that's me and you can put 10,000 to flight. How about we start multiplying everyone joining me, multiplying our power 10 times. I will see you right after the break. Who is God? Is it actually possible for a mortal human to communicate with the Creator even though God is a spirit? If we truly made in God's image and likeness, how are we like God? If we share similar attributes and characteristics, what are they? This 13 lesson teaching by Bobby Indian will increase your knowledge of the God of his universe. The Bible says, if you do not love, you do not know God because God is love. The more we know God, the greater our capacity to love. Do you want to increase your ability to love God, yourself, and those around you? As you listen to this teaching, you will be changed and become a greater expression of God in the world. In these lessons, you will learn about God's independence, his will, his infinite knowledge and greatness. You will see that he is unchanging, holy, omnipotent, faithful, good, and patient. You will learn of his mercy and also of his wrath. To order Knowing God, visit our website at bobyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support 
and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. Pastors, if you would like to schedule Bob Yandian to speak at your church, event, or conference, go to bobyandian.com forward slash invite. I want to go back to that passage of scripture I began with in Zephaniah chapter 3. I'm just going to read the first two verses, 17 and 18 of the passage that I read at the first of the broadcast. The Lord your God is in your midst. The mighty one will save, that's his delivering power. He will rejoice over you with gladness. God loves us and gives, not only we praise him, he praises over us. He will quiet you with his love. No matter what pressure you're going through, no matter what anxiety, no matter what frustration, he will quiet you with his love. You know what his love says? I will take care of you at all times. Then he will rejoice over you with singing. So how great it is to know the Lord who does that for us. Jesus is in his church. Not only is he in our presence, he's inside of us because we are his church. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says, no one who has the spirit of God calls Jesus cursed. The Pharisees called him cursed, proving they didn't have the Holy Spirit. Why? Because all people don't have God's presence, the Holy Spirit living in them. The world is none of his. And Jesus even said that only believers are the temple of the Holy Spirit and he lives inside of us. In fact, the entire Godhead dwells in us as it did in Jesus. The father is pleased to place all of this, all of his fullness inside of us. Colossians chapter one, verse 19. Also Colossians chapter two and verse nine. We have something so valuable. We have no idea the worth of it. The Bible says that this treasure dwells in earthen vessels. All we do is see the earthen vessel. We look in a mirror, we see our body. This vessel that God has t- chosen inside of us is, that's kind of like when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were inside of these earthen pots and the pots were over 2,000 years old. They were so fragile. And they had to be careful how they even picked up these things because they could crack so easily and they'd fall apart out there in the deadness of the Dead Sea and the, and the, and the low, no humidity. But we look at ourselves and we don't often, we see that. We see the fragileness of our body, but we don't see the love that God has for us because it's inside this fragile body that he has placed his righteousness. He's placed the presence of the Holy Spirit, the presence of Jesus Christ and his own presence inside of us. We become the temple of the Holy Spirit. Again, when Jesus said, Matthew 24 walked out of the temple. He told his disciples, take a last look at it because not one stone will be left on another. You might as well say that to your body every day. This may be the last day I look at this body. You know what? Not one molecule will be left on top of another. This body is going to be turned back to dust. That came from dust. It's going to return back to dust. And again, we have no idea of the worth that's on the inside of us. We keep, we keep trying to keep this body up. We keep resurfacing this temple, the outside of us, as they probably did in Jesus' day as they kept renovating it, renovating it, renovating to make it look better and better. But that's what you have to do to your body to make it look better and better. With women, it's more makeup, it's facelifts. With men, it's just trying your best not, you know, to keep your hair and and color your hair and all the different things you do. We don't realize how valuable the inside of us, and this is what God rejoices over. God doesn't rejoice over our body. He gives it healing while we're here on this earth, but even that's only temporary. There's no healing that will keep me here forever. I'm going to die one day. And when I do, this body that maybe could have died at 50 and lived to be 75 or 80 still was alive. But who cares if you got another 30, 35 years out of this body? The point of it is you'll be in heaven at that time. You could care less how long you lived on this earth. The fact is you're now in heaven because you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And this body that was worth nothing suddenly became the temple of the Holy Spirit and he moved inside of us. And of course, Zephaniah didn't know how to say that because there was no Holy Spirit living in him, no presence of God living in him. But he did say this, when we come together. He's in our midst and the God that's in our midst rejoices over us, sings over us because of his great love and his love will quiet us in the midst of time periods where you're so filled with anxiety. When you're so filled with the problems of this world, the Holy Spirit will again bring to you the remembrance of God's love because it was from his love that he died for us. For God so loved the world that included me, that included you, that he gave his only begotten son, That whoever, that's Bob, that's you, believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We have something so valuable, we have no idea of the worth of it. 
If we were to be asked how much money right now we have in our wallet, we probably would know. I don't know how much money is in my wallet. In fact, there's game shows where they, they simply say, how much money is in your pocket, your pocket and your wallet? And you see people just with a blank look, they have to make an educated guess. Well, that's literally what we have. We have inside of us something so valuable, but we don't spend enough time. Now, if I did nothing but count my money three or four times a day, I can tell you exactly how much money is in my pocket and how much money is inside my wallet. If all you do is study the word of God, meditate on the things of God, then you know exactly how rich you are. If you did what Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. You'll know the truth. The truth shall make you free. The sad thing is with many Christians, if we ask them, what's the word of God have to say on this situation? They'll just look at you blank. It's almost like asking how much money's in your wallet. They don't know. You're simply asking, what's the treasure inside of you right now? What scripture are you standing on? I remember when uh, we'd have people come in for counseling and uh, oftentimes it was couple that came in for counseling. And when they came in, they simply just walked in expecting us to wave a magic wand, say the name of Jesus, their problems go away. And the first thing that we would ask, in fact, we had them fill out a sheet of paper because oftentimes just filling out this sheet of paper would eliminate about 50 to 60% of the people coming in for counseling because they never had these questions asked them. Number one is what is the exact problem? And they start writing it down. Husbands talk about, well, my wife does this. The wife would say, well, my husband does this. Next question is, how often have you discussed this and prayed over it with your partner? They would stop and just, uh, we don't. We just argue all the time. And then the next question really nailed it. Which scriptures are you standing on? in this situation. You know what? Lots of them at that time would come back and hand the paper back to the assistant and say, never mind, we don't need to come in. If those three questions just simply literally nailed it. And so if they passed those three and came in, then again, I, and they, they honestly prayed over it. They looked at the word of God. That's the person who knew how much money was in their wallet. That's the person that knew how what promises of God were available and which ones they were standing on. And they probably had just a small question to ask to help bring them a little closer to the answer because they really knew the answer so they just didn't know the next step. Practical things to do. We have so much value in the protection of Jesus, yet we don't have any knowledge of it. My people aren't destroyed. It says for all the things that they think they are, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And it says there is knowledge in the land, but they're not stud- studying it. It's in the word of God. It's at their church service. It's with their minister. It's in books. But how often do people even pick it up? I even speak to pastors. Pastors, it's a warning to you. In meetings, pastors, how much time do you spend studying God's word? And they'll often think, well, you know, here, there, here, here, here. And I said, you know what? You waste your time. You probably spend more time listening to country music than you do listening to a tape or a CD of the word of God or a flash drive. You spend more time listening to classic rock music than you do listening to something in your car. What if you took a CD, put it in your car, and by the time you drove to the church office and drove back home, you could listen to an entire sermon. How much would that change your life? And I've had men who've actually made that commitment. Okay, I'm going to start doing that. And you know what? Within a week, they said, I never knew how much of a radical change even one week would do in the Word of God. Well, imagine a lifetime of it, how much revelation could become. You say, yeah, but I kind of miss my rock music. Not when you start studying God's Word. You won't even think a thing about it. On top of that, when you get to heaven, you could care less how much rock music, country music, or whatever you listen to. Uh, News, you know, people just get obsessed with listening to the news all the time on the radio. It's all they have going on the car. What difference does it make? Because the news changes next week. Whatever stand the president made this week is over next week. And there's a new problem, a new crisis coming along. Why don't you do what Zephaniah did and say, it's not my knowledge of news going on. It's not all these other things. It's my knowledge of the word of God. Jesus Christ is in the midst of me in my family, in my church, but he's also inside of me. And this is what I have. To study God's word tells you just how wealthy you really are in the things of God. God's word, his Holy Spirit, his love and protection over us cannot even be calculated. It's worth so much more than just the financial things you have or just the assets you have in your life. You cannot allow yourself to be taken in by the world or caught up in its thought processes. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter chapter 10. I want you to look with me at verses three through six. Here it says, though we walk in the flesh, 
We do not war according to the flesh. In other words, I've got fists. I could use them, but this is what not what God wants. I could even know self-defense and could level most anybody coming at me, but I do not war according to the flesh. On top of that, this flesh gets old. This body gets old. Have you ever seen great athletes, football players and stuff from the past and look at them today? They can barely get around. Their body just couldn't take it all those years. The same thing even with people that know self-defense later in life. They're stiff, everything else. They couldn't defend themselves anymore, but the word of God continues to increase in power. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Verse four, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. That means fleshly. Next of all, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. These are satanic strongholds, life strongholds, uh, situations that arise in our life. And it says, casting down reasonings and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. This is what Zephaniah was saying. Only through God do we have real deliverance. If God isn't my answer, then there is no answer because God should be my only answer. You say, yeah, but I, you know, I prayed, but natural things begin to occur. That's what God did. God doesn't come in your face and send angels every time. He begins to work through situations and what you thought was impossible suddenly starts to fall into place. You go, oh my goodness, I see what you're talking about, Lord. Lord. So again, verse five, casting down reasonings and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. In other words, it comes back to that. Not only does God, again, deliver us, but I love what it said in Zephaniah. He rejoices over us with singing and with joy. Like a mother who loves her baby and thinks it's the most beautiful thing on earth, so God thinks of us. God loves us more than any natural mother or natural father, any earthly parent can. It says he literally dances over us with joy. This is the God that blesses us. Again, the God that moves inside of us. He dances over us with singing and with joy. And then next of all, I'll finish on this one today. We'll just continue this tomorrow. Our God is a warrior. It doesn't matter how bad the situation is we're going through. God is always greater, more powerful than any problem we can have. Again, I just want to admonish you. Thank you again, all you're watching today. I just want to thank you for joining me each and every day. Even if you're not a partner, you know what? You're important. The fact you watch this broadcast, many of you who have not sent in any finances or anything like that, and maybe you can't afford to send in anything. I want you to understand how important you are. I will meet you in heaven. Let me tell you another great asset is to take the things you've learned here and spread it to other people. In your Sunday school classes, teach it. Just sharing it one-on-one. We'll never know the effect of this till we get to heaven. The accumulative effect, one after another, of people that were changed by the message of the Word of God, including my teaching here. Thanks again for watching. You know what? Spread the Word around. Begin to tell other people about this broadcast because you know what? If it changes your life, it'll change their life. I know the Word of God changed my life, and it keeps on producing over and over and over again. See you tomorrow. We'll continue on with this. Ministers, you can access valuable resources free at ministersclub.com. You'll find topical studies, sermon outlines, PDF books, answers to many questions, and plenty of encouragement, all free. Just go to ministersclub.com. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.